Hello, my name is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to continue the idea that we did last time when we discussed the nature of magnitudes and brightness and luminosity, but now we're going to formulate it in terms of an important thing that we call color. Color is an incredibly important thing to astronomy because, well, things have different colors. So we need to actually know how we can quantify this concept of color. But first, what we need to do is understand a little bit about where color arises and how light interacts with matter. So let's discuss that first before we get into the nature of what color is with magnitudes. All right, so light and matter interact. And if you've ever been alive, you know that light bounces off walls, reflects off of things, comes from light sources like light bulbs, things that are hot glow and so forth. So what matter can do to light is it can allow it to pass through it, such as the glass that's passing through in the lens that I'm looking at you with. Um, it can also reflect light. Light gets reflected off of various surfaces and it can then bounce from one surface to the next. Matter can gain this energy by absorbing light. So if you go out on a hot day, the light from the sun you get absorbed the light, that light in the form of infrared radiation that reflects, that goes into you and absorbs into your skin, as also as the uh, ultraviolet light does the same thing, and then you absorb the energy of that light. Third, matter can lose energy by emitting light. So if it's warm or hot or hotter than the surroundings, then light will spontaneously come off of matter that is warmer than its surroundings and radiate to the surrounding environment and that's called radiative transfer of energy. Okay, so there are two things that are important with respect to color and temperature, and temperature relates to the internal energy of the matter. So the internal energy of the matter um, is what we would call temperature. So the internal energy can have multiple forms. One is the structure of the material itself, that would be the phase of the matter. And the other is the average random motions of the material inside the matter. And that would be the, the vibrations of the mass of it. If it's a gas, how fast it's moving around the room. So the internal energy is a function of temperature. All right, so let's look at the, how color relates to temperature. So first and foremost, color is a funny thing. What is color? I mean, I'm wearing a little checkered red, white, and blue shirt. How do you know what I'm wearing is blue shirt? blue checkers and, blue and red checkers on it with a white shirt and some fun red and blue and yellow things in the background here. How do I know what color is? Well, color is a funny thing because it's defined inside your head. Color is actually a, a concept of relative brightness between sets of things that do reception of light. What do I mean by that? Okay, so your eyes are filled with cells on the, on the backs of your eyes. It's called the retina, the retinal cells. There's the cones and the rods. The rods are for nighttime and the, and the cones are for color in daytime. So the, rot, the cones or the color rods have various receptor cells. And there's maybe, let's just be over for an oversimplification, we know that there's maybe three, let's just call it three. So you've got a set of cells inside the cones that are red receptors that receive and a green receptor and a blue receptor. So a red receptor would only say fire off if red light lands on it or white light in a specific wavelength region. Let's say then a green receptor only fires off if green light or wavelengths of light in a specific wavelength region. Same with blue. So then the relative brightnesses of these, two, these signals from the various cells, the pieces in each cell, determine the color. If, it's a bright, if more of the red cell got fired than the green, then we would call it red. If, more, if the green and the blue got fired, then we would call it yellow compared to the red. So in any event, the red so the color then gets constructed in your brain, and then we culturally decide to call red, red, and blue, blue, and yellow, yellow. yellow. But that's cultural. We want to quantify it. So what was done a long time ago is the Johnson filter system actually tried to mirror roughly what your eye sees, except it extends it into the infrared and the ultraviolet. So the primary uh, filters that are used astronomically, or at least the easiest ones, or some of the oldest ones to use that are still standardized, are the Johnson UBVR and I filters. So we've got a blue filter, which is B, we've got a V filter, which is kind of yellow green, and then we've got a, an R filter, which is red. So the R filter covers a wavelength region about 6,000 to 7,000 
angstroms. The V filter covers roughly about 5,000 or 4, 5,500 angstroms. And the blue filter covers roughly about 4,000 angstroms. So these three filters together allow light of only a certain wavelength to pass through to the detector. Notice how that's similar to what your eye does. But your eye does it automatically. The retina has these cells that only detect the light. Instead, now we make a nice photo detector, some sort of camera, and what we do is we put in front of the camera a filter so it blocks out all except the, the blue light or the green light or the red light. And therefore, what falls on the camera is either blue light or green light or red light. That's different than, the, than, than what happens in your eye. We don't have filters in our eye that filter things out. We have cells that receive the certain things. So we can think of, of, of the cells as kind of like inverse filters. They absorb only specific wavelengths of light. But a filter transmits only certain wavelengths of light. And it's the specialization of this transmission that allows us to actually determine color. All right, so the Johnson's Cousins filter response system goes, uh, has a very specific wavelength uh, transmission, re, uh, frequent transmission wavelength dependency. So, we don't expect to get pretty much any light that is more that is more blue than say 3,000 angstroms uh, in the B filter, and we don't expect much light uh, longer than 5,000 angstroms to pass through the B filter, and that's what we mean by these transmission curves. So the sun itself has a certain uh, brightness in each one of these filters, and we can actually then look at things and do relative brightnesses of the filters. Typically, astronomy is done with relative brightnesses. So you say, oh, this thing is brighter than that thing, and that thing's brighter than this thing, and this thing's brighter than that thing. And the filter system like this makes it very easy because then you can use the magnitude system, which itself is a relative brightness concept. So the visible light bands are only covered by the B, V, and R sections of the Johnson's Cousin uh, filter system. The U section, you're going to have to go way up in altitude in order to use it. And same with the I section, you need to be at, uh, need to be at high altitude in order to use these because the Earth's atmosphere strongly absorbs ultraviolet infrared light. So what we got is we have these wavelength regions which the, which the filter system allows through. All right. Once again, just like we defined with Pogson's system last time, Pogson originally said that every filter system, in any filter system, including the Johnson's Cousins, it, the definition of zero magnitude is the star Vega. So we start with that idea and then say, oh, well, how bright or dim is the object with respect to Vega? And the reason we use Vega, again, is because Vega it it goes across the zenith for many observers in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, so what do we really mean by color? In your eye, it is the difference in brightness that you perceive in the red cells versus the green cells versus the blue cells in your retina of your eye. Likewise, in an astronomical sense, what we have is three filters. So the filters then say, well, what is the, we can then make, so we can determine the magnitude of the, the object, and that's our brightness. Remember, magnitude here is brightnesses. The apparent brightness in the U filter, the apparent brightness in the B filter, the apparent brightness in the V, R, and I. And so what we do is, it's kind of funny, like we've defined magnitudes before, where we have the distance modulus, little m and big M for absolute magnitude. Here, we define the apparent magnitude of an object to be the capital letter of the filter that you're using. So here we say the, the magnitude in the U filter and the magnitude in the B filter and the magnitude in the V and the R, those are just the letters. So we take those values of the magnitudes, the brightness in magnitudes on these things. Not brightness in terms of, of watts per meter squared, or, or uh, that's not how we do it. We use magnitude system because we can easily do differential brightnesses between them. So the magnitudes become our reference point in astronomy, not necessarily flux. We will translate that eventually into flux, but we start with magnitudes. All right, so color then is defined in astronomy to be the difference in brightness between two filters that are adjacent. And you always take the short wavelength filter minus the long wavelength filter. The magnitude in the shorter wavelength minus the magnitude in the longer wavelength. And it's typical that you only, that, that they, you look at adjacent filters and not necessarily span across, but there might be a science reason why you would actually do that. 
But typically, you might take the difference in brightness between, say, the U and the B, and the B and the V, and the V and the R, and the R and the I, and then call those the colors. So a standard color that is used frequently throughout all astronomy is an observation in the B filter and an observation in the V filter. And then you take the difference in those observations, meaning the magnitude difference between B and V, meaning what is the, what is the so if you take the magnitude of B and subtract from it the magnitude of V, that is the color. Kind of a funny thing. So there's lots of different ways we can call color. And so therefore we can quantify color. It's not just calling it magenta or red or puce or aquamarine or any of the names that you'd find in a crayon box from Crayola, all those 64 colors with all those pretty names. We don't care about those names. Those names are really nice and everything and they're very fun to have. But really what we want to do is we want to use the definition of color in order to get us data and understanding. All right. So the blue star, the blue color of, say, the star Sirius. So Sirius is by definition, well, by, not by definition, but by your eye, you can see it in the sky as being a blue star. So therefore, it must be brighter in the blue magnitude, in blue magnitudes, than in V magnitudes. And in fact, it is. So if you take, and likewise, it must be brighter in the V than the R. So if you look at these numbers, the B number, the B magnitude of Sirius, must be closer, uh, must be lower in, abs in value than the V magnitude. Because remember, magnitudes, the larger the magnitude, the dimmer it is. So the more negative it is, the closer towards negative infinity it is, negative, the larger negative number or the smaller positive number, the, the brighter it is. So if you compare a tenth magnitude star to a fifth magnitude star, the fifth magnitude star is brighter than the tenth magnitude. So let's say that a star like Sirius might happen to be uh, in the B magnitude. It's pretty bright. So I'm just going to make up a number here. And the number I'm going to make up is that it has a B magnitude of, say, uh, uh, one. Let's call it a B magnitude of one. But because it's dimmer in the V magnitude, maybe it would have a V magnitude of two. So the color two, C2, which is the color two which in the Johnson's filter system, B minus V is minus one. So there's the color of Sirius in the B minus V. B minus V color equals minus one. And let's say the R magnitude is four because it's a very strongly blue thing. So then V minus R is minus three. So C sub three, which is another color definition in the Johnson's color, Johnson's system, that would be a minus three. So B minus V color is minus one and V minus R color is minus three. Now I pulled all these numbers out of, out of thin air. So don't bother looking them up, they're wrong. So, but anyway, I invite you to actually go look up what the B minus V magnitude colors are of Sirius and the V minus R that are standard. And if you look at the American Association of Variable Star Observers, you should be able to actually see that. All right, so let's take a different star. Also in, say, uh, in, in the winter sky, Betelgeuse, which is in the constellation Orion, very beautiful red star. So therefore, the B magnitude would have to be dimmer than the V magnitude. So. And we also know that Betelgeuse is also roughly a magnitude one-ish sort of star in visual. So let's say the B magnitude is, say, three, because it's much dimmer in B than in V. And we'll say that V is, say, a one. All right. So that makes sense. So B minus V for Betelgeuse would be three minus one is plus two. So now we see that a color that is in B minus V, if it's positive, it's red. If it's negative, the star is blue. So a positive C2 color, B minus V, means the star is pretty much red. If the, if the B minus V color is negative, it's probably blue. And if it's zero, it's probably kind of whitish yellow, like the sun, which is, makes sense. Anyway, so with the same thing with V minus R, maybe the V minus R color is more significant for Betelgeuse, but R magnitudes tend to be a little bit tweaky for a lot of reasons. And we, set, we tend to see B minus V as, rough, as a pretty big standard that it, American Association Variable Star Observers. All right, so the B minus V color will be more positive. The V minus R color will be more positive for a red star. So we can construct all of these colors. And this is like an extraordinarily low resolution spectroscopy. What is spectroscopy? Spectroscopy is where you take the light from a star, say, and you pass it through a prism. And when you pass it through that prism, the light then gets broken out into a rainbow and you see how bright it is at various frequencies. So you really care about how bright it is at various frequencies. That's what you really care about when you're doing spectroscopy. Um, but 
The nice thing about doing filters like this, filter photometry, is that pretty much everything you look at is pretty bright. So, you know, spectroscopy, it can be pretty dim. You need a lot of light in order to make a decent spectrum, but you can do pretty well uh, at, lower, at lower resolution spectroscopy with, uh, with Johnson's filters, with, with such B minus, uh, BVRI and filters, UBDR filters. All right, so this color is important because it does relate to temperature. So let's find out how that is. In general, if we look at the types of stars and we break out their spectra, remember that's what Annie Jump Cannon did at Harvard back in 19, the 1910s and 1920s with her team of computers under Pickering. Um, the spectra of stars were classified according to their temperature. And their temperature was guided by the, by the prominence of hydrogen lines. So, okay. But if you look at the nature of how, uh, how spectral lines look, we see that O stars in general are much brighter. Well, in general, always O stars are by definition brighter in the blue than they are in the red, and M stars are brighter in the red than they are in the blue. Sometimes when we look at spe stellar spectral classification, we forget that O stars are inherently much, 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 much brighter than M stars. But we'll talk about why that is shortly. In any event, right now, what we can do is look at the temperature of a star, and we see that as the temperature decreases, it, gets, it goes from being bright in the blue to bright in the red. And that's why we can say that a blue hot object is much hotter than a red hot object. Red is pretty hot to eyes if you're thinking about flame, but you don't want to get close to a blue hot flame. That's very, very, very hot. In any event, so real spectra of real stars show that hot stars look blue because they're brighter in blue than they are in red. So let's say we put uh, fake BV filters on top of some spectra and see what the impact of that would be. Um, we can easily see that the brightness in B filter for an O star, and that's kind of BVO, right? The brightness of in the blue filter for an O star is the B magnitude is much greater than the V magnitude for the O star. So therefore the color will be uh, negative. And if we look at an M type star, the B magnitude will be dimmer and therefore larger than the V magnitude, where the V magnitude will be brighter and therefore a smaller value. So a big value minus a small value equals a positive value. So the color, for, the B minus V color for M stars is, is positive and the B minus V color for O stars is negative. All right, so that's kind of what we were talking about. The O and B stars, stars are all over the place. And in general, a star like the sun, the G stars right in the middle, their B minus V colors tend to be roughly about zero because the magnitude difference between the two filters is roughly nothing. There's almost nothing. So there is a transition point, and that is roughly around the middle of the spectral sequence and roughly at the G's. Okay, so let's say we instead, instead of looking at it from like a pretty picture rainbow type of things, we decided to look at it from a spectral sequence where we actually measure the total brightness of a star numerically instead of using like, a, like our eyeballs or magnitudes, but we start with say flux, which is watts per square centimeter. That's flux falling upon a per square, yeah, per square, watts per square meter. Well, you know, I could have a meter sized detector, but anyway, the, uh, we then say, well, what's the absolute, what's the absolute flux or the amount of light that is the luminosity falling on our detector? and count the real energy that was being deposited by that light. And we get what we call a spectrum. So that spectrum can be numerically related to the Johnson color system. And we could say, well, what is the B minus V colors for the various objects? And then we see that O stars are, of course, brighter and in exactly the same way that we discussed with them when we looked at simple spectra. So the next question that we have is a rather interesting one. And so we see that stars are organized by their temperatures and O stars are hot and M stars are cool. How do we know this? Why do we know this? And the answer is in the spectra themselves. So the spectrum itself determines the temperature of the star and we just are lucky enough to be able to use the Johnson's filter system to actually determine that much more easily. All right, so when we're looking at the spectra of a star, notice the shapes of the spectra. In, in general, the shapes of the spectrum of a star 
The blue one looks kind of nice and slopey. It starts off uh, in, in, during, in the visible part of the way of electromagnetic radiation. It is bright in the blue and the ultraviolet and dim by the time it gets to the red and infrared. And the situation is reversed for the M stars. So what do these curves mean? What do these, these plots of, of intensity as a function of wavelength mean? Well, they just mean that, um, is that is what we're seeing is if we look at a star, it's really far away. So we're not taking the image of a particular patch of a star. We're looking at it over, averaged over the entire star. So we're looking at the average, say, temperature and the average spectrum of all the regions of the star. Some might be a little hotter, some might be a little cooler. That's what sunspots are in the sun. Sunspots are slightly cooler areas. Prominences are, are a little bit cooler. The sun radiates in x-rays. But if we took the sun and put it really far away, maybe tens of parsecs away, then we wouldn't be able to resolve the sun but we would still be able to get the average spectrum of all the light that, is, that comes to us from the sun. The most important thing though about a star is that no matter how far away it is, no matter how tiny it seems in the sky, it is a big thing. Stars are enormous objects. They're much bigger than planets. Uh, even little M dwarf stars are bigger than the planet Jupiter. So if we take something like the size of the sun, the sun itself is a hundred Earths could fit across it and a million Earths could fit inside it. So these are enormous objects. And an enormous, hot, dense body is opaque. And an enormous, hot, dense body that is opaque means the light bounces around inside it if light is being generated inside of there and it bounces around inside it until everything becomes the same temperature. Once everything's the same temperature inside the star, then it's at the same temperature. And what we see at the surface of the star is that average temperature of all the light that all the material being all the same temperature at the surface. So that's interesting because it's opaque, everything gets to the same temperature. So temperature is a funny thing because it's measure, it is a measurement of the internal energy of the object. In the solid, it's just the things vibrating in place and how much vibrational motion it has inside of the structure of the solid. If you give it enough heat, then there are bonds that must be broken down in order to turn it from a solid to say a liquid or a solid to a gas. But we'll ignore that for just a second because that's a, that's, a, that's a different kind of, uh, of temperature, a different kind of change in, in heat latency and heat latency. But if you have a gas, that's much easier. And stars are gases, they're not solids. So a gaseous ball, a starry gaseous ball, the higher the temperature, the higher the average motion of the molecule, the atoms that make up the star. So they move faster. So temperature itself in a gas is related to how fast the atoms are moving inside it or ions if it's too hot. The way we can then relate temperature itself as a measurement to the speeds and therefore energy, because speed is like kinetic energy. It's the energy of going fast. So therefore the temperature must be an average measurement of all of the speeds of all of the objects in it. It's not everything's going exactly the same speed. That would be kind of weird. But what we see is it's an average speed over the entire, uh, over, over the entire set of molecules and atoms. So, we can relate it to the average kinetic energy of an atom inside of there. And that thing that we call its movement is what we call heat. And heat has a lot of different things that we can talk about, and that would be a thermodynamics course. But let's just start with a relatively easy concept and begin from there. And so heat is something that you measure. Uh, temperature is something you measure with a thermometer. And heat is a measurement of how much wiggling that there is occurring inside of the atoms. A little bit loose definition there, I know, but off we go. We'll just kind of keep with it for now. So, but cold can be defined as the lack of motion. So an absolute temperature scale, we might want to say absolutely cold. We want nothing moving. Well, we'll call that temperature equals zero. And so as you give it more and more heat, it, the things move faster and faster. So therefore, there, the temperature gets higher and higher. Because not everything's at the same motion. It's the average speeds of the object that determine temperature. So the Kelvin temperature scale was defined a long time ago by Lord Kelvin, um, and it's related to zero is the absolute zero of it. And at that time, there is no motion whatsoever on the part of anything that's inside an object that is at absolute zero. Um, the cosmic microwave background is at three degrees above absolute zero, which means it is very cold, but still there's some uh, in, actually an incredible amount of energy associated with that, but we'll let that go for a second. 
The pure water boils at 270, uh, it freezes at least. If you cool water below 273 degrees Kelvin, it becomes a solid. If you warm it above 273 Kelvin, then as it first does, it does a funny thing. First, when it becomes, it's a solid, and then there is heat. As you can apply heat to ice, and it'll change phase from solid to liquid at the same temperature until you've given it enough heat to break down the bonds that make it go from a solid to a liquid. And then once it becomes a liquid, then the temperature again begins to rise because when you apply heat to a, to a phase that is in the phase transition mode, you actually, that's what phase transition means is that you could have the same temperature, but yet the, you don't change the relative, the relative average motion of it. A phase change simply changes the arrangement or the, the, the fundamental arrangement of the atoms and molecules inside of it. So uh, it's a pretty loose definition too. But once we get to 373 Kelvin, then it boils, which then the bonds that make up a liquid then are broken down and you add heat into the liquid to make it become a vapor. It stays at that temperature, 373, until you've given it so much heat that all of a sudden nothing's left in the liquid state and it's all a vapor state and then the temperature can increase again and temperature then becomes, and uh, it still is in all of these cases, a measurement of the average motion of the objects. But heat is, as you can see, slightly different because heat can be applied to something and it doesn't necessarily raise the temperature, which is interesting. And that's about phase transitions and that should be dealt with in a separate video. But for our purposes, for this, all we really want to say is that, uh, that the Kelvin temperature scale for gases, which make up stars, that is a measurement of their average speed. And uh, the Kelvin temperature scale has some basic things. We already talked about water boiling and so forth, but then fusion of hydrogen occurs when the temperature is approximately uh, 13, approximately 10 million degrees or uh, 10 million Kelvin. So we don't say degrees Kelvin, we say degrees centigrade, we say degrees Fahrenheit, but we just say 10 million Kelvin. It's because it's unit like watts or meters. We don't say 10, uh, we don't say 10 million lengths meters. We don't say, uh, we don't say, oh, that's, uh, that's 10 million uh, times seconds, right? Because we don't say seconds are a time. We know it's a time. We know a Kelvin is a unit of, of temperature. So we just say, that's 10 million Kelvin. That's the temperature of that star. Anyway, so light and heat is therefore a different thing. Um, but yet they're all, but they're related. So you may receive light from the sun in the form of infrared photons. And those infrared photons can go to doing one of two things that he, that can go to changing the internal heat of your body. And the internal heat then can be manifested in numerous ways. The most common way is to make the atoms and molecules in your body vibrate or move more quickly. It also can change the state from a liquid to a gas or a solid to a liquid, depending on the intensity on the frequent and the wavelength of the light. So that all depends on how it absorbs and emits it. But from our perspective, what we really care about is that when light falls upon a gas, it, 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 we can treat it as a heat input. And as it, as it inputs that heat into the system, then what occurs is the temperature rises. Now, if it's an average, if it's completely opaque and everything inside there is at, is at thermal equilibrium, meaning that there isn't a place inside the star that is significantly different compared to, the, to, compared to another place inside the star. Well, it's kind of a tricky thing. Stars have to be a little bit out of thermal equilibrium because they emit light and emit heat, so there has to have a source coming there. But if the source, the source of energy inside the star equals the amount of energy that's coming out of the star, then it can be said to be in thermal equilibrium. So as long as the star is in thermal equilibrium, meaning in general it's not getting a lot hotter, and in general it's not getting a lot cooler, and in general there's no big areas where there's motion of heat going from one place to another, then that we call thermal equilibrium. If an object is hot, the same temperature, uh, for, uh, the same temperature throughout, and opaque, then it would be called a black body. A black body is even a stranger object. It's kind of a theoretical, in fact, it is a theoretical object that absorbs all light that falls upon it. And since it absorbs all the light that falls upon it, it doesn't reflect anything. It reflects no light. It absorbs all light. That's kind of a, a 
It's kind of a stretch. There's nothing that does not absorb all light. So any light that falls on a black body gets absorbed and therefore gets mixed around inside the black body until then it become it thermalizes with all the other light inside of that, all the other matter inside of that. And then re and then the black body then, because it can perfectly absorb, it can perfectly emit, and it doesn't hold back certain wavelengths of light. If a black body held back certain wavelengths of light, then it would also reflect those certain wavelengths of light, which is interesting to say. So once, so a black body is a perfect absorber of light and a perfect emitter, which means everything inside it gets to the same temperature. That's what we care about. So uh, it's things that are very close to black bodies in mostly everyday parlance, molten steel at a foundry, the ingots of steel, those are, those are most certainly uh, black body objects. They're hot, they're very hot, they're glowing, they're all at the same temperature. And in fact, if you look inside the foundry, it's hard to tell the color of the sides of the walls of the foundry from the actual molten steel itself. In fact, when they put it in there, you can't see the difference because the steel and the walls and the gas inside of there are all glowing at the same exact temperature. And since they're glowing at the same exact temperature, they have the same exact spectrum because it's a black body spectrum. Okay. The next thing we can look at as a very familiar thing is the coals of a fire. Look deep inside the coals of a fire and on some camping night that you might go out to and the coals of a fire, not the fire flame above, but deep inside the coals where the, below the wood, you, can t you can't tell where the fire begins and where the coals end if you look carefully. In fact, they all have the same temperature, they all have the same color. The only reason something has a slightly different temperature is if it's darker, it's cooler. But if it has the same exact temperature, it'll have the same exact color. So the cool, the hot area that's being shielded inside of the, of the cavity of the black body, of the, of the fire deep down in there, that's a black body too. Now a welder's arc is a very, very hot object, but what actually is the thing that might happen to be a black body? Remember the welder uh, melts, uh, melts something, melts the steel at very high temperature. And so not the sparking stuff, because that would be an emission spectrum. It would be a gaseous form of it. Or, but the sparks coming off, the actual sparks themselves, they're reddish. But if you look at the center of a welding arc's light, the light itself is where the metal has been turned to blue hot. And now blue hot, that area is very small. Remember the foundry look is this enormous thing and you can still look at it. It's bright, but it's not, you can still look at it. But the intensity of light goes up rather rapidly as the temperature goes up. So the melted iron that is being focused on by the arc welder, that's the thing that's incredibly hot and incredibly blue and incredibly bright. So there's something about it getting hot that means also getting bright too. All right. Oh no, now I get to throw equations at you. So equations are a funny thing. So the entire shape doesn't matter if it's a black body, any black body, every black body has a theoretical curve that has the shape that kind of looks like a, an off kilter uh, norm, normal curve or a bell curve. Take a bell curve and like stretch one side long. And that's kind of what the black body curve looks like. The only thing that, that make that can be different from one black body to another is the temperature. And so it just basically scales everything up by a factor of the temperature. So uh, as, as if it's hotter, the, the area of the black body curve scales up by a factor of the temperature to the third power. And so as you get hotter and hotter, the, the area gets hot, the, the temperature gets higher and higher. So it's a very, well, it's actually the temperature of the fourth power is really what it comes down to, but, but still. So the, um, the, uh, the point is, is that every black body has the same shape. Doesn't matter what its temperature is. Um, the same shape, but yet whether it's brighter at one frequency or another, that's a different thing. So different black bodies at different temperatures peak have peak wavelengths at different wavelengths. When they're very, very cool black bodies, as we saw in say the iron foundry or even a very cool star like Betelgeuse, it peaks in the red or even in the infrared. Um, and then as it gets hotter and hotter, it starts peaking in the visible light, like say yellow or green, and, but if you were to see such a thing that's like 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin, to your eye it would look white because it's roughly evenly balanced across the, 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 uh, the spectrum, visible spectrum. But it peaks at specific wavelengths that we would call green if it, were, if it was peaking roughly around 6,000 Kelvin. And once you get above 7,000 Kelvin, uh, the peak temperature, the peak location starts going into the ultraviolet. 
So it starts from the red and infrared moves through the center of the visible spectrum and all the way up to ultraviolet. It just so happens that stellar temperatures, stellar surface temperatures, range in their peak brightnesses for most stars in the visible light range all the way up through the blue light and all the way up through infrared. So from infrared to ultraviolet. That's where stars seem to peak in their, in their black body radiation. All right. So when we take the curves for black bodies and we isolate only the sections that are, that, are, that are visible light, if we isolate only those sections, it just so happens that the actual spectra of stars very closely match the theoretical predictions of what a black body curve of that temperature looks like. They're really, really, really close. It's not perfect, and the reason it's not perfect is because stars have atmospheres, and the atmosphere of the star acts to absorb light from that star and when it absorbs the light from the star, it takes the light away from the star, and then we don't see it, and we see an absorption feature. Maybe we see even emission features, but typically it'll absorb it in one wavelength, and then that, those atoms and molecules will re-radiate it in some other location, and it'll escape in a different way. It doesn't hang on to it, it just re-radiates it in other direction, in other wavelengths. So the sun itself, was specifically the black body for it would peak right around 5,500, 5, uh, roughly around, roughly in the middle of the spectrum, but yet the actual curve, because of this redistribution, is a little bit more blue. So that's kind of interesting. It's real, but even so, the curve for the black, the solar spectrum is really close to a black body spectrum. So what are some other astronomical objects that we see that have uh, black body spectra? Remember, it has to be dense and it has to be thermalized. It has to be all at the same temperature. It has to be one object that's at the same temperature. All right, that's cool. And if it's not, and uh, we'll see what kind of things we have. So if we look at dark, dark dust clouds, deep in interstellar space, the places where stars are being born, dense enough so that they're, they barely collapse under their gravity, they might be a parsec or two across, they're very, very cold objects. They might be 60 degrees above absolute zero. And so even if it's 60 degrees above absolute zero, it can still have a black body curve because that's the average temperature. So if it's an average temperature of that, what's the peak wavelength? Well, the peak wavelength is deep in the infrared, deep in the infrared, if not even in the radio wavelengths. So when you have something at 60 degrees Kelvin, if you look in infrared light, you'll see it glowing. So therefore, that's why the Spitzer Space Infrared Space Telescope has been built and why Space Telescope has been built to look at objects that glow in the infrared and things that are cool objects, very cool objects. A dark dust cloud does not glow in any light in the visible light, and therefore we see it to be dark. If we then look at, say, something like a protostellar object, like one, let's say now a star has formed inside this dark dust cloud. Once it's formed inside there, the star itself is pretty warm, but yet it's not hot enough to call itself a star. Maybe it's a bit warmer than the surface, maybe it's much warmer than the surface of Jupiter, and it might be a few hundred Kelvin. Um, therefore, it seems to be a dull red, but it peaks in the infrared, in the, in the near infrared. Near infrared means just a little bit further red than the, the about 7,000 uh, an angstroms, or 700 nanometers. And you'll notice also that something that is 600 Kelvin is a thousand times brighter at the peak than something that's 60 Kelvin. So the hot, the warmer it is, the much more, the much brighter it is. So by multiplying by a factor of 10 gives you a lot, lot, lot larger factor of, of luminosity in terms of temperature, luminosity. So we go to the sun now, and the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin. And so it's about a thousand times again, brighter than say some dust cloud that's at 600 Kelvin. And it peaks roughly in the visible wavelength region, but it has significant output in infrared radio. Well, not really a lot of radio, but significant infrared output and significant ultraviolet output. The sun's uh, spectrum is pretty close to a black body and we can use that as a measurement. And, and what we feel as warmth on a summer day is the infrared light that passes from the sun through the atmosphere to us as part of the black body spectrum. The, the sunscreen you wear is for the intense ultraviolet light that, uh, that, that drops off rapidly at hot, shorter wavelengths. All right, so then the next thing we can look at is something even hotter, say uh, the, the accretion disk around a black hole. So there's material falling into a black hole, and as it falls into that black hole, 
it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and just before it falls into the center of a black hole, it gets to be tens of thousands of Kelvin. Uh, actually, it gets much hotter than that, but we're talking like the outskirts, or maybe we're even looking at an extraordinarily hot O star. So an extraordinarily hot O star might be tens of thousands of Kelvin. And those things are even more luminous than the sun, thousands of times more luminous than the sun. And they, their peak wavelength is way out in the ultraviolet, and they emit even more visible light than the sun does. They emit even more infrared light than the sun does, but they emit even more ultraviolet light. So in general, the hotter something is, if it's a black body, which is mostly a star, stars are mostly black bodies, or really close to black bodies in terms of their spectra, then it's brighter overall wavelengths, and the peak of the brightness moves to be shorter and shorter and shorter wavelengths. All right, so the law for black bodies says the wavelength maximum the maximum wavelength of the peak of the curve just depends on some little number b, which is a measurable number. And then you divide, it's the inverse of the temperature. So the hotter it is, the shorter the wavelength is where the peak exists. And finally, these, and how much energy does get gets dumped out of an object that has a particular temperature in Kelvin if it's a black body. The temperature of an object goes as the temperature, the, the energy output per surface area on the surface of the object goes like the temperature of the fourth power. So we take a standard sized patch and we take that patch, maybe it's uh, the size of your hand or something, we put it on various things that are hot or cool and we measure the total energy output through a standard patch, say, you know, it's like five, 10 centimeters by centimeters or five centimeters by five centimeters, whatever it happens to be. The energy output through that standard patch will go like the temperature to the fourth power. So something that's twice as hot as something else will emit 16 times as much energy. Something that's 10 times as hot will emit 10,000 times as much energy. And something that's 100 times as hot will emit 100 million times as much energy. So the hotter it is, the more energy it puts out, and it's a very fast function of, of temperature. So these are our basic concepts of stellar of, of stars. If, and it makes them pretty easy. Stars are pretty close to black bodies. If it's hotter, it's brighter. If it's hotter, it's bluer. That's really what we really care about. So when we take about the, when we look at all the stars that we see in the sky and then we look at their stellar spectra, we now have a pretty good firm foundation of what we can look at. And we take the spectra of a star and we see that O stars are bluer compared to M stars, so we know what that means. And now then we can use the Johnson's filter system to uniquely determine the temperature of a star. All we have to do is calibrate using the spectra on high level calibration, what the spectrum of a star is, like an O star, an M star, G star, whatever. And we learned what the typical, the average spectrum of those are, what their temperatures are according to spectra. And then we can step it down. And you do it easier by saying, well, look at the colors in the B minus V. The B minus V color uniquely determines the temperature of a star. So all we have to do in order to learn about something very important about the, the star, meaning how, much, how fast the atoms are moving on average at the surface of the star or inside, right at the inside of the star, is take a picture in with two filters in front of it, say the B filter of Johnson and the V filter of Johnson, put pictures in front of those things and difference the brightness between the two. And once we do that, we know the color index. The color index is uniquely determined by the temperature. So this is an amazing consequence. And those colors, the B minus V colors, transition relatively smoothly from, from the hot to the cold. There's some lumps along the way, but in general, the more negative the color, the bluer. The more positive the B minus V color, the redder and cooler. B minus V negative, hotter, 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 bluer. B minus V positive, cooler, 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 redder. So we can go on and on with this kind of stuff, and we will. So this is a really interesting thing where we take the concept of the magnitude system and apply it to some deep physics about the nature of how atoms move inside an object. And we'll talk more about that next time. See you soon.